Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining our today's webinar. Today, a superstar, Donna Kloss, is kindly speaking to us about legal aspects of occupational health and specifically about neurodiversity. I was thinking about how to introduce Donna today. From one side, First, it looked a bit easy because most of you know Donna Kloss. From the other side, it was a bit difficult. I was thinking about introducing her as a professor, as a barrister, or lots of other titles she has. But to me, Donna is Donna Kloss. It's more than all the titles. And I was thinking we are absolutely fortunate in the world of occupational health to have Donna Kloss with us. Donna, many thanks for all your generous help and support to their specialty. Back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, by absolute chance, this week is Neurodiversity Week. And when we fix this date, we weren't aware of that. So it's very, very appropriate, isn't it? And uh, I have to warn you that uh, the number of cases going to employment tribunals uh, where the claimant claims to be neurodiverse is rising. It's a, a very popular uh, claim, which is going to employment tribunals. So it is very likely that you in your practice, are you going, going to be involved in a, a tribunal claim at some stage? So this is important. So I'll try and give you um, the basics of this. Obviously, I can't give it to you in all great detail. Um, I have written um, an article on it in, if you take occupational health at work, the journal. Um, and um, obviously, um, you know, if you've got questions, uh, I, I might be able to answer those in due course. But I'm, I'm going to deal with the bare bones. Right. Now, the first question is, is uh, um, uh, um, or, or, uh, a neurodiverse condition, is it a, a disability? And therefore, can somebody with such a condition claim disability discrimination? Now, I'm not a, a, a medic. I'm not an expert in this area, so I'm not quite sure uh, exactly what names that we give to these conditions. But I understand that we generally talk about people on the autistic spectrum, and that includes Asperger's, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, Tourette's and so on. But uh, you're the experts on that. And uh, somebody with such a condition may be disabled under the Equality Act, but they may not. It depends on the facts. Now, one very important point, which has come uh, up in uh, discussions I've had through emails, is that a formal diagnosis is not necessary in order to establish that somebody has a protected disability under the Equality Act. So uh, this is not a question of diagnosis. Occupational health is not concerned with diagnosis they are concerned with functional capacity. So that's what you should be looking at. You shouldn't be looking to see whether they've been, been to see a specialist and paid 500 pounds to get diagnosed. You should be looking at this person's functional capacity. And remember that the definition of disability is a physical or mental impairment. That's one. Two, which is long-term. That means it's either lasted 12 months or is likely to last for 12 months. And three, which uh, has a substantial, that means more than trivial, adverse uh, effect on somebody's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities, which includes work activities. Now, the autistic spectrum, as I understand it, runs from birth to death. It is, as I understand it, an impairment, but that's a question, isn't it, a fact for you to look at? Uh, certainly potentially an impairment and uh, in practice it is likely to uh, interfere with normal data activities so you should be looking at those three things when you're dealing with a particular person uh, do they comply with those three elements and if they do it is likely that they have a disability but of course you would never say that, that they definitely have because you're not qualified to say that you can say likely you can say unlikely, you can say very likely or very unlikely, but don't say uh, definitely that somebody has a disability. You're not qualified to say that. It's case law on that. Next slide, please. Um, 
Now, uh, normal day-to-day -day activities, there's lot, there was lots of arguments about those over the years. Originally, we used to say it's got to be something which is outside work, like getting up in the morning, getting washed and getting dressed, walking to the bus, um, being able to use a computer, talking to people and understanding what they're saying to you, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually the case went to the European Union court when we were still a member state of the EU, and they said uh, it must be understood as referring to a limitation which results in particular from physical, mental or psychological impairments and which hinders the participation of the person concerned in his professional life. And following that uh, judgment from the EU court, we had the case of Patterson and the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, which was a man with dyslexia. He had um, uh, been appointed a police constable. He would uh, passed the exam for sergeant. He would passed the exam for inspector. And now he was um, sit sitting the exam for superintendent and he failed it. And he said the reason he'd failed was because they'd failed to make reasonable adjustments for his disability. He said he was dis disabled. And uh, the issue was, is sitting an exam for a promotion to superintendent in the Metropolitan Police, is that a normal day-to-day -day activity? And I have to say at the time, I thought, well, maybe it wasn't, but I was wrong. The court said, yes, it is, because it is something which limits him in uh, his, uh, it, it hinders the participation of that person in his professional life. That's what, that's what it does. So it is. Um, anyway, uh, you should look now. There's a recent um, regulations that uh, came into force January of this year, Quality Act 2010 Amendment Regulations 2003. Reference to a person's ability to carry out normal dated activities are to be taken as including references to the person's ability to participate effectively in working life on an equal basis with other workers. Now, the reason why they've had to pass those regulations is because of Brexit. And this is to ensure that this biopsychosocial definition of disability, which came from the EU, remains in our law. Uh, because uh, otherwise, you know, the government is trying to get rid of anything that came from Brexit. So this, the biopsychosocial definition remains in our law because of these regulations. So that's an up to date um, change, which only dates from 1st of January this year. Next slide, please. Um, so um, can you recommend adjustments even if there's not been a specialist diagnosis? Well, as I've said, you can say, in my view, it is likely this person has a disability, even if they haven't had a specialist diagnosis. And therefore, you are able to assess an individual by means, I think, of a workplace needs assessment. And it's not obligatory to obtain a specialist diagnosis. It's good practice for employers to offer to pay, but most many of them wouldn't. They're expensive. So they don't have to. There's no obligation on an employer to pay. But it may be that you would recommend a sympathetic employer to pay for such an assessment. But that depends on the facts of the case. And I'm not sure. I mean, I would have thought you probably could um, decide for yourselves whether it's a disability without having a specialist diagnosis but again it's a question of fact isn't it uh, you're dealing with the cases I'm not next slide please the role of occupational health well the Society of Occupational Medicine has produced this guidance evaluating and supporting neuro differences at work which I would strongly recommend that you get a copy of uh, again, this is not something that I'm an expert on, but uh, the society has produced, an expert working group has produced this guidance, so I strongly recommend you obtain that. And it suggests that you have an initial screening conversation, uh, you then uh, recommend adjustments, for example, remote working, technology coaching. Then if that doesn't work, maybe you have a specialist review, uh, maybe you have a workplace needs assessment in C2. And if sufficient, maybe the last resort is you say, well, um, the person should have a formal diagnosis. But that's not absolutely essential. And I think one very important point that this uh, guidance makes is that the cost of adjustments for somebody may be less than the cost of the, the assessment. Uh, because people on the autistic spectrum are very good at some things. 
I mean, many professors of mathematics in universities are on the autistic spectrums because they are very, very good at that kind of way of thinking. Um, and so uh, these they're doing a, a first class job better than many other people. Um, and if you've assessed them as being on the autistic uh, spectrum, uh, uh, if the employer accepts that, then uh, you wouldn't need a specialist assessment. But again, depends on the facts. Uh, uh, they recommend to skip to the workplace needs diagnostic assessment if, an, if there's an imminent risk of job loss or there's a safety risk. Next slide, please. Now, look at this case. It's a very interesting case. One of the interesting things about this case is that the uh, Employment Appeal Tribunal has told us, and this is something I keep telling you, that the guidance, that is the official guidance, on the Equality Act is wrong. I, uh, I often say to people, they say, oh, well, the guidance says we do this, that and the other. And I say, well, that's only guidance. That's not the law. And in my view, the law is different. And this is a very good example of such a case. Now, this man was an IT systems manager. He had difficulty communicating with others. He found it very difficult to work in a crowded office. He needed clear written instructions and set routines, but he was good at his job. And he'd been employed for a long time. Now, his previous manager was sympathetic, appreciated that he had these problems. So his previous manager had allowed him to work considerable amount of time from home. But he did the job. I mean, there was no question he wasn't doing the job. He did the job, but he did it from home. However, the records, the official records said that he was working so many hours in the office, which was wrong, but the manager allowed him to do that. Then a new manager is appointed, a real job's worth, and he accuses him of falsely recording his working time. And he activates the disciplinary procedure. He's saying, you're lying to us. You said you were in the workplace and you weren't. Um, so uh, he was put in a disciplinary procedure. Now, this is somebody who can't cope with things like that. And he's so distressed by this that he then accepts voluntary redundancy to avoid this disciplinary procedure. But his trade union representative, representative suggested that he obtained an autism assessment, and he did. And the nurse specialist in the community adult Asperger service diagnosed him with autistic spectrum disorder and Asperger's. So Elliot then sues the employer, Dorset County Council, and says, um, you, you, you forced me to um, uh, accept voluntary redundancy because of the way you treated me. That was a breach of your, uh, your duty of trust and confidence. And therefore I was unfairly dismissed. And I, also I was discriminated against because of my disability. Next slide, please. So the case goes to the local tribunal, I don't know, Portsmouth maybe, or Southampton maybe. And uh, the judge there says, well, I don't think he is disabled. Because he said, well, I know a lot of people who aren't very good at communicating with others. They're rather shy and they don't really like working in an office and so on. But they're not disabled. Um, my view is that this person is not disabled. And uh, in deciding that, um, he looked at, uh, he or she looked at the guidance uh, on the definition of disability, the official guidance, and also the Equality and Human Rights Commission statutory code of practice, which he's directed to do. And the guidance says that in deciding whether um, has, uh, somebody is, has a disability, you look at to see whether they have a limitation going beyond the normal differences in ability which exist among people. So was uh, his problem in communicating, et cetera, et cetera, was that something which uh, was went beyond the normal differences in ability which existed among people? And this judge said, no, it doesn't. It's not bad enough, it doesn't. So not disabled. Um, next slide, please. Case goes to the Employment Appeal Tribunal and they say the judge is wrong because he applied the wrong test. The test isn't comparing him with other people in the, in the community. The test is to compare him 
with his own abilities. This man with this intelligent, these abilities in information technology, does the fact that he has autism, does that interfere with his normal dated activities? And of course it did. What you do in these situations is you compare, you ask not what somebody um, cannot do, but you look at what they can do with difficulty. Sorry, sorry, you concentrate on what the person cannot do or can only do with difficulty. See, I'm getting confused now. Not what they can do. You don't look at what he could do. You look at uh, what he can do with difficulty or what he can't do. Because people with this sort of disability, they develop coping mechanisms. They avoid doing things which they find difficult. Um, they take longer to do things uh, because they find them difficult. So that's what you should be looking at. And so the comparison in his case should be with somebody of his skills and intelligence who wasn't autistic, i.e. his own innate abilities if he did not have an impairment. And of course, he did find difficulty in communicating with other people. He did find difficulty in working with an office. So it was held that he was disabled. So the judge was wrong. The test that they applied was wrong. Uh, and the Employment Appeal Tribunal was saying, this is the legal test. Forget the code of practice, forget the guidance, they're wrong. Next slide, please. Next question is, does the employer know about the disability? Because with most cases of disability discrimination, employers can't be liable unless they either knew that the person had a disability or they ought to have known by usually by the person's behavior. So reasonable adjustments, there's no duty to make reasonable adjustments if you didn't know, and you couldn't possibly know that the person had a disability, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, when does the employer know? Well, uh, this is an important recent case, 2019 Q against L. Again, in the Employment Appeal Tribunal. If it's in the Employment Tribunal, Appeal Tribunal, it is a precedent and other tribunals have to follow it. Q applied for an office job with an employer called L. He was referred to occupational health for assessment of his fitness for work. This was an independent occupational health provider, OH Assist, in fact. So this independent occupational physician wasn't working directly for L, it was an independent occupational health provider. He interviewed Q and Q voluntarily disclosed to him that he had two rets, which I understand is a neurodiverse condition. So he told the doctor that he had two rets. The doctor decided that he was fit to do this office job and that it was not necessary to, to mention that he had two rets. So the doctor wrote a report to which Q gave consent to say that he was fit to do the job, full stop. When uh, Q started work, obviously, uh, as time went on, uh, the employer started to realize that he had problems, that he needed um, clear instructions, uh, about what to do and, uh, and how to do it and so on, that he had difficulty in communicating and so on. So over the months, Q be uh, L became aware that uh, he, he possibly did have a disability. Anyway, Q then sued L and said that he was disabled and L had failed to make reasonable adjustments. So L said, the defence was, I didn't know he was disabled, certainly at the beginning when he started working for me, but I didn't know he was disabled. And the Employment Appeal Tribunal said, well, look at the report from Occupational Health. Does the report from Occupational Health mention that he has Tourette's? No, it doesn't. Therefore, the employer did not know at the beginning anyway, uh, that he had, um, he was on the autistic spectrum. Because the fact that occupational health knew does not mean that the employer knows. The employer is not deemed to know what occupational health knows, but doesn't tell them. 
So you look at the report. The employer is only deemed to know what's in the report. Um, however, of course, uh, the tribunal said, or EAT said, later on, after several months, the employer did have what we call constructive knowledge because they ought to have realised from his behaviour and his problems that there was, there was something wrong and they at that stage should have sent him back to occupational health and asked for advice about adjustments and so on. So eventually they had constructive knowledge, but they didn't have active actual knowledge because it wasn't in the occupational health report. Now, I think that's an important decision for you. Next slide, please. Uh, so that's uh, more details. The consent was limited to the disclosure of the opinion and did not include the medical opinion on which it was based. Uh, in fact, in this case, the judge said uh, that you had to have written consent, but actually that's wrong. Uh, even under the GDPR, you don't need written consent because we're not talking about GDPR consent, we're talking about common law consent. I'm not saying that you don't get written consent. You should always get written consent if you can. But uh, written consent is not mandatory as long as you've got consent. Um, the point about getting uh, it in writing is that it's much easier to prove. Next slide, please. So that raises the whole issue about whether a job applicant or an employee should disclose their disability. Now, there is no obligation on anybody to disclose a disability. There's no legal obligation to disclose a, a, a disability. That, that's uh, the uh, guidance on the Equality Act says just that. So you don't have to tell the employer that you're autistic. You don't have to tell the employer you've got two rets. Um, however, of course, in practice, it may be a good idea to do that because then the employer has a duty to make reasonable adjustments. And in occupational health, you'll be talking to people and you'll be saying, look, I, don't, I won't actually tell them you've got two reps. But, you know, if I do tell them that you've got uh, you're on the autistic spectrum, then they would have a duty to make reasonable adjustments. Whereas if I don't tell them anything, then they won't be under that duty. So you might be better off with me. I won't necessarily give the uh, diagnosis, but me giving some indication that you may need adjustments and making recommendations. But that's your decision, not mine. And I will not report without consent. This case was only in a tribunal, but I think it's interesting. Um, it's not a precedent because tribunal decisions aren't precedents. It's interesting. This is a job applicant who disclosed a recent NHS diagnosis of Asperger's. Uh, he was applying for a job. He was offered the job subject to satisfactory references and occupational health clearance. The employer then got references and the references were poor. And they were probably poor because previously he hadn't been diagnosed and therefore he was not getting adjustments and therefore he was finding difficulty coping with the job. So the, 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 these bad references arrive and the employer said, oh, well, we can't have him, he's hopeless. So they didn't wait for the occupational health referral. They just turned him down. They said no. And the court said tribunal said well that was a failure to make a reasonable adjustment you knew he had Asperger's you had given him the uh, the offer of a job subject to OH clearance uh, you should have waited mm -hmm. you should have got the OH clearance and you were in the wrong and therefore you're liable next slide please um the uh, I'm sure you all know section 60 of the Equality Act 2010 the employer must not ask health questions pre-job offer, but the job offer, of course, can be conditional on satisfactory uh, clearance. But there are exceptions to that. And I'm just going to deal with two exceptions. The first is where it may be relevant to making adjustments to the recruitment procedure. If there's going to be an interview, if they're going to have to do a PowerPoint presentation, uh, you might have to have an office on the ground floor. You might have to have hearing assistance. You might have to, if they've got dyslexia, give them more time or modify the test. So uh, that's a situation in which you can 
ask if they have a disability, which may need um, adjustments to the recruitment procedure. The other main exception is if you're asking questions about a function which is intrinsic to the job. And the guidance says, for example, if they're going to be a scaffolder, you can ask them whether they can climb ladders. Um, I would think in the area of dyslexia, maybe, um, you can ask whether they're able to uh, produce documents. However, I would think in practice, you would probably uh, allow them or recommend they go through to the recruitment procedure to see what their performance is like there. But again, you know, that's something which you're going to have to decide. It may be in the applicant's interest, and you should be telling them this um, if you see them before, um, it may be in your interest to disclose because, um, you know, if you disclose your uh, dyslexia, then you may be getting more time, which and therefore you may get the job, which you wouldn't get, jo get you wouldn't get the job if you hadn't disclosed. Next slide, please. I've given two examples. BT and Maya is a case which went to the Northern Ireland Court of Appeal, so a very high court. Uh, Maya um, had um, autism um, and he applied for a job. He, he was very good at IT and he'd got a very good degree from um, Queen's University Belfast, which is a very good university. So he was, he was clever and he'd got a good degree in information technology. And he implied, applied for this job with British Telecom. Now the job involved um, technical um, issues. It wasn't customer facing. It was, uh, uh, he had to be skilled in technical matters but he didn't have to talk to people and communicate with people, which he wasn't very good at. Um, now the system in British Telecom was the first thing they did was they gave him an automated situational strengths test, which in effect said, well, if you were in this hypothetical situation, what would you do? Um, it was online and that was the, the first test. And remember, they knew because he told them that he was autistic. Now, apparently, I didn't know this, but people with autism find it very difficult to answer hypothetical questions because that's not the way the brain works. And so um, uh, Maya failed that test miserably. And that meant that he didn't go on to the technical test, which he would have passed with flying colours because he was good at it. And so he sued British Telecom and he won because uh, the court held, well, the employer knew that you had autism, knew you had difficulty with this kind of test. They should have adjusted the, uh, the tests for somebody with autism. And I'm hoping that that's what they do now. Uh, they should realize that this kind of test may be suitable for the run, ordinary run of the mill people, but people with autism, it's, it's difficult. And therefore they're going to turn down people who are going to be very good at the job just because they fail this initial test. So th they've had to look at their whole um, um, testing um, to, to, to fit it in. Actually, I asked somebody from the Faculty of Occupational Medicine about this um, and uh, Ira Madan said, oh yes, yes, oh yes, we do make adjustments. Yes, and if somebody discloses, yes, we do take in a, that into a, account. So that's good news, isn't it? Uh, government Legal Services in Brooks was uh, where they were using an MCQ test, which is what the faculty uses, which I don't like. <laughs> um, so they were using this MCQ test. And again, apparently um, Brooks, she was applying for the government legal services. She was a solicitor. She was she was good at her job, but she couldn't do MCQ tests. Again, there's something apparently in the autistic spectrum they find this difficult. And so she failed and she sued and she won because they should have realized she told them that she had problems uh, with this kind of testing. She said to them, can I just, instead of you know ticking the box, can I just write, you know, this is, what I think the answer should be. This is what I would do in this situation. I can do that, but I can't choose. I can't tick boxes. Um, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. No, because that would be unfair to other people. Um, but they were wrong. They should have, they knew she was autistic. They should have adjusted the tests. And apparently MCQ tests are not appropriate. 
Uh, again, I'm not an expert on this, presumably you are. Next slide, please. Now, this is a case which I got quite shocked about. It's only a tribunal case. It was in the Manchester Tribunal last year. This is a woman, um, she uh, was very bright. She had a first class degree in policing. She'd always wanted to be a police officer. Even when she was a little girl, she'd always wanted to be a police officer. So she applied to the uh, Cumbria police, this was, and um, she was appointed in 2016. Now at the time she applied, she revealed that she was autistic. And occupational health at that stage, the FMA, um, Force Medical Advisor, um, interviewed her, looked at the question, decided that she was fit to be a police officer, passed her fit. And she worked for four, five years, uh, and she had glowing reports. Everybody she'd worked for, everybody she'd worked with, said she was very, very good. Um, she applied for firearms training. And apparently, if you're going to do firearms training, you've got to pass, uh, I think, seven tests before you're even allowed on the training. So she, she passed all the tests, fitness, confidential screening, advanced driving, taser, use of a taser, fire shooting test. She passed them all, flying colours. Everybody said she was great. So she was then referred to the occupational physician, the force medical advisor. The medical advisor said there was no medical condition that could bar her from uh, firearms duties, but he added, this is quotation, the decision comes down to the risk the organisation is prepared to accept. I'm not sure why he said that, you'd have to ask him, but I'm quite surprised at that, because ev everything about this woman was that she was first class and she passed all the tests. The deputy chief constable who was looking at this took fright. He was worried about this. Well, what does he mean, accept the risk? So he took further advice. He went to the College of Policing and they said, she's good, she's fine, put her on the training. He went to her superiors. She's good, she's wonderful, put her on the training. But he was still afraid, so he didn't. He withdrew her from the firearms training. He wouldn't allow her even to go for the training. She sued disability discrimination. She clearly had a disability. And the tribunal said this is direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, and disability-related re discrimination. It is also a failure to make a reasonable adjustment. Because if you were that worried, you could at least have allowed her to go on the course and see how she did. And that would have been a reasonable adjustment. Um, so uh, she won on absolutely every point. Um, I would like your opinion. Why would you say to somebody with such an enormously good record, oh, well, the decision comes down to the risk that the organisation is prepared to accept? And I'll leave it there. Next slide, please. Now, um, another interesting case which went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal was this one. This was a job applicant uh, and the employer said you have to fill in an online application form, which was very common. So Mallon sent his CV stating that he had dyspraxia. And he said, can I fill in the form on the phone because I have difficulty completing documents. Actually, to be fair, I'm not very good at completing documents online. Uh, but he said, I am disabled. I have dyspraxia, which is uh, a neurodiverse condition. And therefore, you know, can I speak to somebody on the phone and they ask me the question and then I give the answer and they fill it in for me. The manager then sent him a number of emails saying, what is this disability? What is this dyspraxia? Mallon did not reply. So the employer then said, uh, well, sorry, if you can't even fill in the um, uh, application form, you can't have this job. 
so he was turned down. Uh, Mallon um, sued Employment Tribunal, Disability Discrimination. Yes, he was disabled. And the tribunal said, the EAT agreed, a reasonable employer, when faced with an individual with a dyspraxia diagnosis asking for an adjustment, would have telephoned him asking for uh, uh, more information about his difficulties. And just to say, oh, no, well, no, that's it. Um, we won't consider you for the post. That was a failure to make a reasonable adjustment. Um, and um, given uh, his difficulty with written communication, his failure to explain by email was reasonable. So the manager was in the wrong and the case, uh, the employer, AECOM, lost that case. But it emerged that this man, Mallon, was making a business out of suing employers for disability discrimination. He had sued a number of other employers. He'd applied for a job with a number of other employers and they hadn't allowed him to fill in over the phone and he'd won a claim against them. He was making a business of it. So what the EAT did was to send it back to the Employment Tribunal and said, uh, um, we think he has been discriminated against, but will you ask the question, will you answer the question, whether in fact he was, this was a genuine job application. Did he really want that job? Or was he just um, seeing whether he could catch that manager out? Uh, but I think, you know, that's instructive, isn't it? To, uh, to employers, you know, why, why would you not? If somebody tells you, uh, you can dyspraxia, you can ask OH about it, it is a recognized condition. Why wouldn't you ring them up and say, oh, I'm sorry about this problem. You know, um, tell me what you need. What, what, why was he so adamant that he wouldn't do it? I, I find that difficult to understand. Next slide, please. So if you look at Section 15 of the Equality Act, this is discrimination related to a disability. And that says, and this is the one that uh, most of them are using now, where the employer treats the disabled person un unfavourably, not less favourably, because of something arising in consequence of the disability, he is liable unless he can prove either that he did not know or could not reasonably be expected to know of the disability or that what he did was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So uh, it may be a case where somebody is guilty of misconduct. Um, uh, they have a disability which has affected that. And the tribunal said, well, it was dis disproportionate to sack them for that misconduct. You should have taken into account that they did have a disability and maybe a final written warning. And there are several cases on that. This case was McQueen and the General Optical Council. McQueen, uh, poor man, he had dyslexia, Asperger's and neurodiverse traits, whatever that means, and hearing loss. The employer had provided him with several reasonable adjustments, but he continued with challenging behaviour, including meltdowns, which I presume meant that he started getting very angry and um, shouting at people. And he had a habit of standing and shouting at colleagues. Um, he didn't sit down, he stood up and shouted at them. Now, the medical advice, presumably that was occupational health, I'm not sure, um, was that his per he, ha he had a personality, in addition to all his neurodiverse conditions, he had a personality problem which was not related to his neurodiversity. The employer got so fed up with him, they warned him that he could face dismissal. And he sued them for that. He said that warning was discrimination. Well, it was treating him unfavorably because of his disability. And the tribunal, the EAT, said, well, no, um, they didn't warn him because of his neurodiverse traits. They warned him because of his personality problem, which was that he was always having these meltdowns and shouting at people. So uh, he lost that case on disability discrimination. And uh, maybe that's something that you're going to have to look at. Is the fact that this person is difficult to, to deal with and angry and so on, is, is that related to their neurodiversity, in which case the duty to make adjustments, or is it just their personality problem? Maybe you could even ask whether the personality problem was a disability, but the tribunal didn't in this case. 
So they said um, the, the GOC was not liable. However, the, the, Gen the General Optical Council had made a big mistake because when he raised the grievance, they were so angry with him, cross with him, they didn't hear it or do anything about it. They just put it on the back burner for over a year. And so although he lost on disability discrimination, he won on a, a failure to um, deal with his grievance and victimizing him by not dealing with his grievance. So he won, he won on victimization. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, now, uh, you know, maybe you do know uh, that there are regulations which um, set out there are certain conditions where, which are excluded. And these are the Equality Act 2010 disability regulations. Um, and there are a series of conditions which are what I call antisocial conditions. They're not protected by the Equality Act. Uh, most common, probably in practice, is somebody who um, has an addiction to a substance, an alcoholic or drug addict. That's not a protected characteristic. Um, but uh, a tendency to physical or sexual abuse of other persons is an excluded condition and cannot be treated as an impairment under the Equality Act. But I think it's interesting to look at this case, which isn't an employment case, it's an education case. Education cases don't go to employment tribunals, they go to the, uh, uh, the um, social security tribunals. Well, no, the sorry, the education tribunal. There are special tribunals which deal with this. Um, and this case, C and C, those were the parents of this child, against the governing body of a school, Secretary of State for Education, and also the National Autis Autism Society, went to the upper tribunal. Case of an 11-year-old autistic child who was aggressive to other pupils and hit, te hit a teaching assistant with a, a blackboard um, rubber and uh, pulled her hair. And the school gave this child a fixed term exclusion and the parents complained to the tribunal because they said, this child has a right under the, uh, um, the um, equality, um, the um, um, European, European Convention, sorry, European Convention on Human Rights, sorry, European Convention on Human Rights. She has a right to education. And what you're doing is you're taking away that right to education by excluding her for the very condition that means that she is aggressive and she does attack people. And so uh, you have a duty of reasonable adjustments for people with this condition. Um, and for that reason, you, you mustn't exclude them. You must deal with these problems. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what's wrong with her. Um, she is autistic. That's why she does these things. So uh, the fact that it's, uh, tendency to physical abuse of other people, which is an excluded condition, that should be completely disregarded. And uh, it was held by this upper tribunal that, that was right. And therefore that the regulations, the Equality Act regulations were wrong because they conflicted with the Equality and Human Rights Convention, which takes precedence under the Human Rights Act. The case went to a House of Lords, uh, well, the issue went to a House of Lords Select Committee and they recommended that the regulations be amended. And they said, we, we think that's right, that uh, certainly in education, children should not be punished um, because they uh, manifest symptoms of their uh, neurodiverse diverse, diverse disorder. Of course, I'm not saying, and I don't think they were saying, that you know, if you, this child had been seriously aggressive and had caused serious harm, not just of this, of this one occasion, but all the time, then it would be a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim to exclude them. And that's not what they were saying. They were saying, you have to make allowances, you have to train the teachers, you have to train the children uh, to make allowances for somebody for this condition. But if you look at the McQueen case, of course, um, in that case, uh, it was held 
that the person's aggression wasn't related to the disability. So maybe this child, it wasn't that they had uh, ADHD that caused them to attack this assistant. Maybe it was just their personality. So that would be another issue that could arise in this kind of case. Next slide, please. Now, this is a case which uh, um, I discussed on, uh, on LinkedIn um, and it's going on appeal and I think it will go further. This was a manager with excellent long-term long service. He'd worked for Lloyd's for 20 odd years. No problems, no disciplinary, uh, disciplinary problems and certainly never accused of uh, anything racist. And he was at a training session. And the training session was about uh, equality and diversity. And uh, the uh, lecturer was talking about um, the language which should be used or rather not used, uh, to, uh, which might offend people. And this man, um, he had dyslexia. And he had heard uh, black people with whom he worked use the N-word, and I will not repeat the full, but I think you know what I mean, to each other, joking. And he'd also heard them singing rap songs, which used the N-word, but not just the N-word, the full word. And he said to this lecturer, quite innocently, well, what would happen if I heard somebody I was working with uh, maybe a, somebody from an ethnic minority, use this word. Would, would I challenge them for it? Unfortunately, he didn't say the N-word. He said the full word. And the lecturer went off sick, was off sick with stress for five days. He was reported to the manager. He was put on a disciplinary and he was dismissed for gross misconduct, for using this word, which was an offensive word to people from an ethnic minority. He complained, he said, uh, well, you have to take words in their context. I didn't use this in an offensive manner. I, I used it because I wanted information. And actually, if you look at it in context, it was reasonable for me to use it. And also, I've got dyslexia. So I find it difficult um, uh, to reform it, uh, it caused him to reformulate questions and speak in haste before he lost his train of thought, contributing the way he, ex he expressed himself. So he won. Tribunal said unfair dismissal. It wasn't within a range of reasonable management responses to dismiss him for this one word in the context with an excellent record over 20 years. They also said it was disability discrimination because they should, had not taken account of his dyslexia, the effect it had on him. Uh, maybe, and he said, well, you know, I'll go on another training course. He apologized profusely. He had never used it before or since. This is just this one occasion. He said, you know, I'll do anything that you ask me to, to put this right. Uh, and I sincerely apologize for it. And maybe it was enough then. Uh, the tribunal said to give him a warning, but he, they thought dismissal was not proportionate. That case has caused an uproar. Um, there are many people who are saying that's a terrible decision. Uh, Lloyd's Bank is in difficulty because uh, they are having to keep in employment somebody who has committed this major crime. And so it's going on appeal. And I think this is very interesting because to me, uh, using offensive language uh, has to look very much at, on context. And also, I think um, dyslexia, uh, as the tribunal did, should have been taken into account. So I have to say I agree with this decision, but there are an awful lot of people who don't agree with me. Next slide, please. I think that's it, isn't it? Yes. Any questions? Thank you so much, Donna. It was an absolute... Lovely, wonderful presentation. Many, many thanks. Uh, do not see any questions in the question and answer section, actually. Nothing oh. here at the moment. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, was... Any questions? 
You haven't had any problems? I personally have a question. Let's just start with my question, if you don't mind. Um, it's about behavior in the workplace, actually. Mm -hmm. So it might be related to any health conditions, such as psychosis or sometimes some other mental health conditions and sometimes neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. How much employers should tolerate it and how much is it going to be acceptable? Because it's a very... Um, difficult topic basically from one side yes this is disability from the other side it's it's about the workplace and the environment and all other things basically well i think um sorry each case depends on its facts unfortunately but i think you look very much on the nature of the job now you work in healthcare don't you yeah well i think you know the welfare of patients is the first uh, priority isn't it in healthcare so if this person, although we're sorry for them because they have a disability and they find things difficult, um, well, like, um, you know, the man in the General Optical Council, um, you know, if, it, if they're impossible to work with and they may uh, damage patient or they may threaten the patient's welfare, then I think it's perfectly reasonable for the employer to say, I'm very sorry, you're not suitable for this job, you can't do it. But uh, before they do that, obviously, they must look at reasonable adjustments, which could perhaps be moving them to a non-patient facing role or something of that kind, if they've got it. But if they haven't got anything else, uh, I think also, you know, you do a probationary period, don't you? Um, uh, but yes, I'm sorry, I, I can't advise in every case, but I think it's a balancing act. You look at the, uh, the job, you look at the problems that this person is giving rise to, you look at the context, and then you say, and if you've thought about it and you've thought about adjustments and you've got evidence which you can put to a tribunal, I think you're going to win. Uh, but that's that's my advice. Mm. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. Any questions? OK, your presentation was absolutely clear and lovely to me. So there is no questions here. No questions. Uh, <laughs> Let me just ask one more time. Any questions by anyone? Advice on the, um... Hi, I've, I've, oh, sorry, I've put one in the chat. Um, oh, okay, great. Do, you, you, you can ask it here, actually. Yes, ask it here. I just, I just wondered, my question was, is there a, um, a time when someone should disclose a disability, i.e. if they've had an interview and been offered the job? For example, is there a kind of um, time frame of disclosing a disability after having an interview and being offered the job? For example, they can they can say I'm never going to. They can say to you, I'm not going to. I don't want you to reveal it. Uh, however, of course, what you'll say is, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think it's going to become reasonably obvious when you're actually working that you do have a problem. So my um, um, advice is to tell the employer now, and I will suggest adjustment. But if they say no, 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 and no, I'm, I don't want you to say, um, and you think they're otherwise fit, then as in the, uh, the, the Tourette's case, they don't have to reveal it. There's only one point about that. Section 7 of the Health and Safety at Work Act says that an employee has a duty uh, to, um, um, I can't remember the words of it, but uh, both for himself and for, uh, oh yeah, that's right, to ensure his own health and safety and the health and safety of people he work with. Now, if this disability means that they are a health and safety risk, then uh, they could be convicted of a crime if they haven't revealed it. Um, so I, I presume that when you're doing fitness for work tests, that if somebody discloses something which is going to make a health and safety risk, you're going to say to them, look, I've either got to tell the employer this, but if you say I can't, then I can't pass you fit. Is that what you do? I mean, you wouldn't pass somebody fit if they, uh, you knew that they had a, a condition which was a health and safety risk, would you? You'd just no. uh, unfit, wouldn't you? I cannot pass this person fit. Is that, I assume that's what you do. Well, I, I don't work in... Um occupational health actually I'm an occupational therapist but I'm just interested in the kind of timelines of um disclosure really there isn't a time I mean they can say well I'm never I'm never going to tell them mm. so um maybe you know that 
people will say, oh, so-and-so is a bit, bit strange, but, you know, that's him and he does a good job. So that they never, they work there for 20 years and nobody has ever told they're autistic. Uh, I don't know, I don't know about you. I have uh, friends, maybe they say it about me. Um, you know, I, I think so-and-so is a bit autistic. You say things like that, don't you? But they've never actually revealed it if they've ever had a diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you. It, Donna, is it correct if we say that if the employee, if, if the employee would, you know, disclose the diagnosis later on, then they're not going to help themselves because if something happens and the case would end up to the tribunal, then, um, you know, um, this is not the fault of employer that they haven't done anything because they didn't know anything about the case. So it's better for the employee to disclose it earlier rather than later, although some of them may not do it initially because they're a bit scared of doing that before employment and then they do it during the employment. Am I correct, Donna? Is this correct to 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 assume in this way? Presumably, you you have these sort of discussions with people. You say, "Well, you're telling me now. You didn't tell me when you started, but you're telling me now that you've got bipolar disorder. You know, uh, they've had some problem." Um, I really think that uh, you should be uh, you should allow me to. I won't say bipolar, but I'll give an indication that there's a problem, and recommend adjustments. Because if I don't. You know, they're going to say, oh, well, this person's been off sick for uh, three months and there's no reason given, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's the sort of conversation you're going to have with people, isn't it? Yeah, great. There is one more question in the chat section I found, although just for colleagues, there is a there is a section on question and answer for next time. If you can kindly write your questions there, it's going to be much easier for me to communicate that with the speaker. But the question is about, let me just read that for you. I just found it, basically. Uh, it's by Dr. Oli asking about, the question is about Crawford versus Chief Constable of Cumbria. And it says, if the Chief Medical Advisor would have advised on a risk assessment performed by the employer, rather than saying the decision comes down to the risk the organization is prepared to accept, would this be more prudent? I just don't know why I said it. I mean, um, there was absolutely no evidence that she was unfit. Well, at least I would have thought he could. He, he might have said she has a condition, um, which um, my advice is that uh, you should put her on this on a trial basis, something like that. Uh, uh, I think he should, could have said that, but I don't think why. He should, yes, I agree. Yes, um, you should do a risk assessment. But, you know, they'd done a risk assessment because all the superiors said that she was first class and she'd passed seven tests. What else would she do? <laughs> I, I, yes. I just couldn't understand it, what, what this FMA was up to. I talked to John Harrison. You know, John Harrison is the head of the College of Policing Occupational Health Unit, if that's what it's called. Um, and he was at the conference in Birmingham. And he said, oh, he's just covering his back which I wouldn't have thought is very professional. Do you agree with that? Yes. Thank you so much. Great. Very helpful. Okay. Um, so there's no other questions at the moment. Um, let me just say another big thank you to Dana and many thanks for all the participants in the webinar. Uh, wishing you all the best and a lovely evening. And Bye, everybody. Easter to everybody. Bye. Happy Easter. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you.